Good evening and welcome. My name is Rachel Grunwald and I'm the Director of Programming at JW3. I am delighted to welcome you all, wherever you are around the UK and the globe, to join us tonight at this very special evening the latest in our Global Diaspora series of high-level conversations, touching on issues that concern Jewish communities around the world. This flagship series is supported by Genesis Philanthropy Group. Genesis are key partners for JW3 in many areas of our work. For tonight and all their support and partnership, we thank them. Just over a year ago, JW3 was a beautiful community and arts centre on the Finchley Road in North London, full of life and argument and laughter. Today, that beautiful building houses a volunteer-run food bank and kitchen that has distributed nearly 140,000 meals to local people in need. And that life, laughter and argument is here online. And though I am delighted to say that our building is now reopened for children's activities and will in coming months open its doors to more and more of you for concerts, performances, lectures and more, from now on, and for always, JW3 will be both that wonderful physical space where everyone is welcome and this virtual space where so many tens of thousands of you have joined us over the past year. And we've managed to make that leap because we have a mission which was never tied to a building. Our mission is to increase the quality, variety and volume of Jewish conversation in London and beyond. Part of the Jewish conversation is and always will be about justice and also about injustice about what we can do to alleviate it, and what we can learn from others who have done more than us. We are inspired by those who seek to redress injustice wherever they find it. Which is why we are privileged tonight to be joined by Albi Sachs, South African Jewish activist, judge and tireless campaigner for human rights and democracy. It's especially meaningful for me to introduce this event as I've had ringing in my ears for the past 10 months, a comment made on Facebook during an event we produced bringing the community together when the Black Lives Matter movement swept the world following the unjust murder of George Floyd. We asked, what can we do to tackle racism within our community as well as outside, to ensure just treatment and a warm welcome to all? The Facebook comment was, is a simple thing we can do to amplify the history of Jews that have made major contributions to civil rights. That stuck in my mind and for simple, I read powerful. And here we are tonight, amplifying, celebrating, and I hope learning so that we can better address injustice, exclusion, and inequality wherever we find it. I'm delighted to say that to aid us in that, we're joined by Adam Wagner, a leading human rights and public lawyer at Doughty Street Chambers. For the past year, he has been specialist advisor to the Joint Committee on Human Rights COVID-19 Inquiry. He's acted in some of the key human rights cases in recent years, most recently for Reclaim These Streets on the leading COVID-related protest case, in a Supreme Court case about the prolonged solitary confinement of children, for the parents of Harry Dunn in their claim against the Foreign Office, and in the Equality and Human Rights Commission investigation into anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. Adam's also well known for his human rights advocacy work, having founded both the multi-award winning human rights charity Each Other and the acclaimed UK human rights blog. He's a sought after legal commentator and hosts the Better Human podcast. He's a visiting professor of law at Goldsmiths University and was shortlisted for Human Rights Junior of the Year in the 2020 Legal 500 Awards. Adam and Albie would be delighted to welcome you into the conversation once they've spoken to each other. Indeed, that's the point of this evening. So please do put your comments, put your questions into the comments section underneath the video on YouTube or Facebook, and we'll pass them to Adam to feed in. You can post a question at any point. Once again, welcome to one and all. Over to you, Adam. Good evening. Thank you so much, Rachel, for the kind introduction, and to JW3 and the Genesis Philanthropy Group for organising this event this evening, which I have been looking forward to from the moment that I was asked to do it, and I really am honoured to be doing it. Um, I should say that if you want to share feedback on the event, only positive feedback or negative feedback, um, please do so at jw3.org.uk forward slash feedback, and we're just putting up that on the screen now. So I'm truly honoured this evening to be in conversation with Albie Sachs, or Albie, has, he's asked me to refer to him. Albie is a freedom fighter, a lawyer, and a former justice of the Constitutional Court of South Africa, one of the most important living human rights jurists, whose decisions are cited in human rights um, judgments across the world. Being a human rights lawyer in the UK, 
you might risk losing in court, maybe being criticised in the press. We don't generally face physical danger or threats to our lives. But because of his opposition to apartheid, as a young lawyer, Albi was imprisoned twice for months at a time in solitary confinement. And then in 1988, he was almost killed in a bomb in a car bomb attack in Mozambique, organised by the South African government, and he lost his arm. So I'm truly delighted and honoured to introduce Albi Sachs. Uh, okay, do I say hi, Adam? You hi, can Adam. Say, say whatever you like. <laughs> okay, hi, Albi. Well, I, I can't see the audience. But from the description, I think you're all over the world. Uh, and, and I'm absolutely delighted to have this chance. Uh, I know Dowdy Street Chambers, and, and I think, uh, Adam, you've got a wonderful resume uh, as, as a young civil rights activist lawyer. So I'm looking forward to our engagement very much. Thank you. Um, so I, I wanted to start, um, Albi, um, I guess in the middle um, with that car bomb attack in 1988. And um, in preparation for this evening, um, I read um, your Soft Vengeance of a Freedom Fighter book, which describes your recovery um, from that, your long recovery from that, um, from that terrible event. Um, and one of the things that struck me was the, it, it surprised me how, how physical the book was, how you spoke, you spoke so much almost as if you were um, rec we were recovering with you in the book, and it's it's an amazing book actually, um, it, it, you know from from a human perspective. But what what struck me when considering it in the context of what had come before and what came after, um, it really did, a dem it really was a pivot point in your life, 1988. It seems between that part of your life when you were a freedom fighter, when you were in exile, um, because of your um, because of your opposition to the South African government. And then shortly after returning to South Africa and, and working on the constitution and becoming a Supreme Court justice. Um, do you think it's, is it fair to say that that was a pivot point and did it, do you think it changed you in a, in a way which allowed you to take on the next stage in your life? It, it was absolutely pivotal and, and in utterly surprising ways. Uh, the bomb itself wasn't, all that much of a surprise. Uh, Ruth First, who'd also been in Mozambique, having come there from England, uh, having been in exile, she taught the University of Durham, she went to Mozambique, when Mozambique became independent. She was killed by a letter bomb. So that threat of a bomb was there all the time. Uh, so that wasn't a surprise. Uh, so let me just describe it a little bit to you, because uh, it was April the 7th, which is the day of the Mozambican woman, a public holiday, and I'm going to the beach in the morning, meetings in the afternoon, and boom! Suddenly, terrible darkness, and I know something awful is happening to me, and I don't know quite what it is, and then, in the darkness, I hear a voice saying, Albi, this is Eva Corrido, you're in Maputo Central Hospital, your arm is in lamentable condition. You must face the future with courage. And I said into the darkness, what happened? And I heard a woman's voice saying, it was a car bomb. I fainted back into the darkness with a sense of joy. I knew I was safe. I kind of half thought that I was being kidnapped to be thrown into prison in neighboring South Africa. And that sense of joy somehow seeped into me when I found myself lying on my back, feeling very, very light, and I can't see anything. And I told myself a joke, uh, a Jewish joke about Tommy Cohen, and when I tell the story, I always say, you like me as a Jew. It's an old joke. He falls off a bus and he does what appears to be the sign of the cross, and somebody says, Heidi, I didn't know you were Catholic. What do you mean Catholic? Spectacles, testicles, wallet and watch. Uh, I don't think everybody tells themselves a joke after being blown up, but somehow to me that was very 
symptomatic of, of an urge for survival. And for some reason, I started with testicles and everything seemed to be in place. And, and uh, the story went around the ANC camps afterwards. And the first thing Muhammad Albi did was reach for his balls. And I've tried to be matcha all my life without success. I had about 15 minutes of matcha fame. Uh, I feel now wallet. Heart seems to be okay. Spectacles, my head. There's a crater. My brain's damaged. I, I'm in big trouble. And then my arm slides down, my good left arm. I've lost the bottom of my right arm. I've only lost an arm. And I had a sense of joy. It's a moment you're waiting for. You're a freedom fighter. Will they come for me? Will they come for me today? Will I be brave? Will I get through the night? And they'd come for me. They'd try to kill me. And I'd survive. And I had a total, utter conviction that as I got better, my country would get better. That was 1988. And I got better. And I went back two years later to South Africa. And we started working on a new constitution. And somehow that bomb blast, I was like bored again. I had to learn to stand, to tie a shoelace, to write with my left. Look, mommy, I can write with my left. But somehow that bomb blew away all the heavy misery and pain I brought with me when I went into ex exile in England, after the solitary confinement, the sleep deprivation, torture, water being poured over my head, eyes being prized open. It was all blown away. I was getting better. My country would get better. It was pivotal. In, in, in that sense. And, and you know, since I'm speaking to an audience that um, is, is largely Jewish, uh, there was a sequel, an interesting sequel, when I came to write The Sort of Energy of Freedom Fighter. Some months later, I'm now out of hospital, I'm recovering, and I get a message from Oliver Tambo, the president of the ANC, that he's asked two members of his National Executive Committee to come and see how I'm getting on. And one of them who comes, his name is John and Cuddy Meng, he'd seen me growing up, and he'd lost his son in a bomb blast. And the other was Jacob Zuma, who's been in the news very, very much recently, former president of South Africa, facing imprisonment right now uh, because of his defiance of, of a court order against him. At that stage, he was a freedom fighter in exile like I was. And they want to know the story. How am I getting on so they can report to the president? And I tell them that joke. And I want to get John and Karimeng with his long face to laugh, and I can't. And Zuma is roaring with laughter. And when it comes to the final testicle speaker, one of them watch, he almost falls off the chair. And I say to myself at that time, What's happening here is, is so special. He has a Zulu speaker sense of humor, the African delight in storytelling. You savor every little bit. You don't rush to the climax of the story. And I'm telling this Jewish joke. And that's how we're going to get the new South Africa. You come in as you are. You bring your culture, your personality in, and you share it with everybody. Sadly for him, having become president, who's now in a difficult position. Happily for me, at any rate, uh, my life now is very, very strong. I had wonderful years on the court, uh, and, and I'm proud of my country, what it's achieved, uh, and hoping that we can deal with the corruption and the violence and all the problems that are really facing us. Can you, can you tell us about the day you met Henry? Yes, uh, Henry. So now I'm a, 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 not a junior judge, a young judge, not even young. Uh, I'm, I'm a, a recent judge uh, on the Constitutional Court, the top court in our country. And the telephone rings and the voice says, uh, reception here. It's a man called Henry who says he has an appointment to meet you. And I say, uh, send him to the security gate. And my heart's going boom, 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 boom. Henry had phoned me to say, is Henry van der Westhuizen? 
And he was the person who had organized the placing of the bomb in my car. And he's now going to South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but he'd like to see me before he goes to the commission. Am I willing to see him? And I said, yes. And I go to the security gate, I open, and I see he's younger than me, he's tall and thin like I am. He's looking at me, I'm looking at him. And I'm thinking, so this is the man who tried to kill me, and he's looking at me, so this is the man I tried to kill. We hadn't met before. We hadn't fought over love, job, passion, or anything. But he was on that side, I was on this side. In any event, we walk to my chambers, and he's fighting like a soldier. And I use my best judge's ambulation to try and slow him down. And we get into my chambers, and we talk, we talk, we talk, we talk. He tells me how good he was at school and, and, and how good he was at university. And he went into the army and he's almost bragging about it. He went high up in the army, high up. He became a senior person in the head squad. And so I've got to pat him on the back for that. In any event, he tells me about the planning of the bomb uh, and that they had delayed the explosion for various reasons. Uh, he was taken off the case. Afterwards, I was blown up. He knew to the bomb that he placed. In the end, I said, Henry, I have to get on with my work. He stood up. I said, normally, when I say goodbye to someone, I shake their hand. I can't shake your hand. But go to the Truth Commission, tell them what you know, and maybe one day, maybe one day we'll meet. I forgot about him. The end of the year, several months later, I'm at a party. I'm with a friend. The music is loud. We work very hard as judges. I want to relax and I hear a voice saying, Albie, and I took my mind. Albie, it's Henry, I can't believe it. It turned out the organizers of the party were filmmakers uh, who were making a film about one of the only two soldiers who went to the Truth Commission. Anyway, I'm surprised to see him. We get into a corner uh, to get away from the sound of the music. And he said, I went to the Truth Commission and I spoke to Bobby and Sue and Farouk and I told them everything I know and 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 you said that one day and I said, Henry, I've only got your face to tell me what you're saying is the truth. I put out my hand and I shook his hand. I almost fainted. He went away beaming. But I heard afterwards that he suddenly left the party went home and he cried for two weeks. I don't know if it's true. I want to believe it's true. I'm not even checking up. I'd rather have that hope that it's true. It's more important that one rascal cries and feels the enormity of what he'd been involved with than that a rascal is thrown into jail. So he's not my friend. I won't invite him to have a drink with me or to go to a movie, but if I'm in a bus and he sits down next to me, I say, Henry, how are you getting on? Because somehow he's like entered the new South Africa. He's taken that little step. And it's been liberating for me as well. Instead of the enemy being that dark, void out there, abstract, it's a person, a person like me who's moving on. And, and in that sense, the Truth Commission helped to liberate me from a kind of vague background dread by giving a personality to the person who tried to kill me and bringing us in connection with each other in, in a non-abrasive way. You, you make it sound so natural that you meet the person who tried to kill you um, and, and you have this sort of humane dialogue with them. But I think for a lot of people, they would, they would expect the opposite or they would, they would expect the opposite of themselves. Um, and you talk about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, would it be fair to say that you, um, that there were lots of people involved with setting that up, but you were involved in a very particular aspect of it, which was the amnesty aspect, and which seems to me as a lawyer to be an extraordinary and very different way of, of conceptualizing justice. The idea that if you go and tell the truth, you will receive an amnesty from criminal charges. Can you just talk about the, the thinking behind that? Because it's very different to what we see um, in, in most justice systems. 
Yes, you know, it wasn't theorized. It wasn't abstract philosophical discussions. Uh, it was responding to, to the needs of our country uh, to get to grips with the terrible things that had happened, but find mechanisms of restorative justice. Uh, justice, the way I'd grown up in our legal system in South Africa, heavily derived from common law in England in, in a number of respects, with the terrible apartheid elements in it, uh, justice was seen as, as, as punitive, uh, retributive, uh, calling people to account through punishment or making them pay money and even through the death penalty. We wanted to create another kind of justice, restorative justice, justice that would bring people closer together. In a sense, Henry was a victim of the apartheid system, in a sense, because he'd been brought up to believe in the things that he was believing in. He'd been trained to do all that. Uh, and he wasn't, in a sense, more responsible than the people who'd voted for the government that had passed those laws, uh, the, the manufacturers who provided the instruments that were used to keep us locked up. Uh, you know, where was the responsibility? It was a deep, spectral responsibility. We had to change our society. We had to get the votes for everybody. We had to have a new constitution that granted rights to everybody. This was transformative. And simply going for particular individuals, particularly one who had the courage to come forward and say, I did wrong, to my mind was much more meaningful. And, and there was a trigger for me. Uh, sometimes, uh, I think it was Gandhi who spoke about experiential truth. It's not logical, philosophical truth, or observational truth, experiential truth that you derive from experience. I'm lying in my hospital bed at, at the London hospital. I'm recovering and I get an envelope those of us who are older will remember envelopes with stabs on and you would lick them and I'm opening with my one hand and it says, don't worry, Comrade LB, we will avenge you, signed Comrade Bobby. And I think avenge me. We're going to cut off the arms, we're going to blind in one eye. Is that the country we are fighting for? If we get democracy, if we get the rule of law, if we get freedom, that will be my soft vengeance. Roses and lilies will grow out of my arm. And you can say that's romantic. It is romantic. And it's fantastic. And it's elevating. Uh, and, and it's restorative for me. It gives meaning. Sending him to jail doesn't give meaning to my arm. It's punishing him, making him feel pain. That's not going to help me. But to understand why I lost my arm is part of a voluntary endeavor to bring about transformation and change and to see the fruits of that, 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 that would be wonderful. So it was with that kind of philosophy. You know, I, I remember, uh, Adam, uh, just when Mandela had been released, I'm interviewed by Anthony Lewis, the New York Times, and he said, okay, I'll be you're going back to South Africa now, and this is your chance to, to send to jail the people who blown you up and I said, I don't know, uh, Tony. I always thought there was something wrong with me, even when I was in jail. And I should have been hating the gods. I should have been imagining as they went away after having delivered the plate of food and the fork that I had a, a knife that I was stabbing them in the back with. And I didn't. I didn't. I felt I was an inadequate revolutionary, that, that there was a failure, there was a deficit. He said, Albie, oh, you can relax. I've just spoken to Nelson Mandela. He said more or less the same thing. We want transformation and change. I spoke to Walter Sisulu, Robin and Becky. So I was part of a culture. It's not just a personal thing. Our vision was to transform our country, to get the cruelty out, to end capital punishment, to end the violence, to end the division of people, to, to find, connect up with, with our humanity. Uh, the people in the regime who'd done all these terrible things, they wanted a blanket amnesty. Just wipe the slate clean, and we refused. You can't have a blanket amnesty. Then there's no accountability. But accountability can take the form of you come forward and you acknowledge what you did. They aren't, weren't asking for forgiveness. I didn't say I forgive you, Henry. It's not for me to forgive. I think of all the other people 
he did violence to, but it's for him to move forward and take advantage of the new generosity, if you like, of the oppressed people in Parliament, adopting the, the uh, epilogue to our constitution that spoke about the need to deal with the untold suffering and injustice of the past, but not in a spirit of vengeance and retaliation, but in a spirit of conciliation, reconciliation, and Ubuntu. And Ubuntu is such a powerful African concept of human interdependence. I can't separate my humanity from acknowledging your humanity. I don't diminish my freedom by acknowledging your freedom. I don't reduce my person, personal significance by pushing away you as a competitor, but through sharing, through sharing, through sharing, through sharing, uh, through Ubuntu. Uh, and it was that magnanimity you like, not just to one great leader by Nelson Mandela, but something deep, especially amongst poor people, that kept us together in the hard struggle days. It's now being expressed in the constitutional format and in law and these amazing uh, experiences, uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu traveling around the country, hearing the stories of those who suffered and another group of the Truth Commission, hearing the people coming forward and acknowledging what they did. There's no scope for denialism in South Africa because the killers, the torturers themselves have come forward and told the story. And somebody, I think, put it very, very beautifully, an American political scientist, that converted knowledge into acknowledgement. We knew these things were happening, that people were being assassinated, tortured to death. That's statistical. Acknowledgement is imbibing it, taking it into your worldview. Where was I? What was I doing at the time? How could I do these things? How can we prevent these things from happening again? Which is enormously uh, important for our country. Today, there are still cases of people who did go to the Truth Commission, who weren't prosecuted, who should have been prosecuted. This is now 30 years later, uh, people are angry. Uh, and until we have full equality in our country and equal life chances, there will always be a sense of resentment that some of these uh, scoundrels and killers and torturers got off spot free. But overall, it is a tremendous process. Uh, and we've had the, the, if you like, the kind of, of, of joy and pleasure of sharing our experiences in, in Sri Lanka, in Colombia, in Northern Ireland, of finding ways and means of transcending the conflict and the pains of the past, not through simple classical punishment or total amnesty, but through this process of engaging people, telling the truth, let the truth come out, and then moving on. You speak um, about the values um, un underlying that, and you've spoken about this, the African values. Um, can you talk a bit about your upbringing and, 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 and particularly your parents and your Jewish background and how that influenced in your in, in your reading of your own life, how did that influence what happened later and what and the path your life took? Yes, it, it came, it came, how did it come? Well, my father was Soddy Sachs and my mother was Rachel Ginsburg. So you'll guess that they were of Lithuanian origin. Uh, my mom had come aged six months as a baby, so she'd grown up in South Africa. My dad was about six. And they were fleeing from the pogroms in Lithuania. And I'd hear stories from one of my uncles about uh, every Easter, the Cossacks, for some reason, would ride up to the shtetls uh, and, and say, as the Jews killed Christ, we're going to kill the Jews. And they would hide in the forests and hide in the basements. So there was a sense of injustice that they brought with them. And, and many of the people who came Yiddish-speaking, uh, a burning desire for freedom. Uh, and many became socialists. And, and my mom and dad met in the Young Communist League. Uh, when I was growing up, they separated afterwards. My dad was expelled from the Communist Party for what is called right-wing deviationism. 
my mom stayed on uh, and she would say to me, tidy up, tidy up, Uncle Moses is coming. And Uncle Moses wasn't Moses uh, Khan or Moses Levine, it was Moses Kutani, a black African man who was the general secretary of the Communist Party. So I grew up in a home where my mother, a white woman, was the typist for a black man, whom she had enormous love and respect for. And that was unusual in all white homes, including Jewish homes in South Africa. At the same time, with their political beliefs, came a strong secularism. They rebelled against the religion of their parents. So I grew up in a very, very secular home. So the Jewishness didn't come to me through faith, through the Torah, or references to the Talmud, or through the rabbi, at all. Very, very secular. But it came through to me in that sense, I suppose, of being the other and being a non-religious Jew. I was the other of the other. Uh, and that, in a way, made me see conscience as number one. The most important element of a human being is conscience, your true beliefs. And if you don't believe in God, you can't pretend to believe in God just to keep in with the others. That would be disrespectful to me and to God if God exists. And that's quite a tough thing for a young kid to adopt a position. And yet it's given me a huge respect and tolerance for faith. Completely different from mine. Your view is completely different from mine. That's the number one thing for any human being. That, that would be quite central. Uh, strangely enough, I only came to read, it wasn't even the Torah, it was called the Old Testament. When I was locked up in solitary confinement, the only book I had. And I read it through, looking for consolation and hope. And terrible day, 24 hours with nothing to do. And I would restrict myself to two and a half pages a day to keep it going for as long as possible. And so much of it I found was smiting and smiting and smiting and being smitten. And I wasn't getting any consolation. Then I come to the era of, of Solomon and the beautiful Psalms and the Song of Solomon, wonderful reaching out to the nations and then smiting and smiting and then the prophets. And that was very powerful for me, Isaiah, especially Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah. And the turning swords into plowshares and, 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 and spears into pruning hooks and making war no more. That reached me. Uh, and, and kind of, I've had a very strong Jewish month. I don't know if it's connected with COVID, uh, Passover, I don't know. Uh, so I'm questioned a lot. Uh, and, and I say almost rather glibly, what connects me with 3,000 years of Jewish history is Karl Marx and Sigmund Freud and Albert Einstein. These crazies with the millenarian worldview linking up with the prophets, it's something that came like, if you like, with my mother's milk, uh, that sense of resisting injustice and persecution. But I always add, and my Auntie Rosie's tagler that we got at Rosh Hashanah, because uh, every uh, Rosh Hashanah and, and, and Pesach, we would go to Uncle Eli and Auntie, uh, Auntie Rosie's place, uh, all the Jewish cousins and uncles and aunties and so on. And I loved that. It wasn't religious, but it was a sense of family, of connection. Uh, and, and to this day, uh, there's something in terms of the cuisine so it's maybe the simplest of tastes and the highest of ideals that connect me uh, to the Jewish community and, and the Jewishness. As long as there's anti-Semitism in the world, I am a very, very proud Jew. And sadly, anti-Semitism is likely to be around. Sadly, 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 for a long time. Well, I, I, I certainly identify with that from my background. I, I was very involved growing up with um, Habonim, the youth movement, the socialist youth movement. So my... Um, my sort of some of my central experiences involved Karl Marx and the you know that the fierce secular Judaism um, sort of fierce identity uh, Jewish identity without the without God I guess um, but one thing that struck me and and you feel free to to shoot this down um, it, you 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 
you and two sort of defining values for you seem to be well first of all human dignity which is I, I think you said on desert island discs it's one of the the two human rights principles along with proportionality that you'd take with to a desert island um but also you know turning the other cheek um seems to be you know far more than an eye for an eye seems to be something which is is at the center of, of who you are as a person and as a lawyer and as a jurist and I wonder whether, you know, th that seems to me that there's a synthesis there between Jewish values and, and Christian values. Or is that, am I being unfair? And not at all, not at all. And, and, and I'm sure if you look at Islam, uh, you'll find very, very similar tenets are there and, and uh, Hinduism and, and uh, traditional African beliefs. Uh, one can find these profoundly humane concepts sometimes dressed up in terms of the deity of a universal spirit, uh, sometimes just a kind of an ethical core that, that, that's very, very powerful. You know, when Oliver Tumble, who, who was about to become a minister in the Anglican Church in, in 1956 December, he's going to marry Adelaide uh, and become an Anglican minister. Uh, then the treason trial arrest took place, he's thrown into jail, uh, into the prison where we built our constitutional court now. So he said Providence had some other ideas for him. He was a deeply religious person. And I remember him calling me in one day uh, in Lusaka. I was in, in the Putu. Uh, I happened to be in Lusaka. Uh, and he said, he's going to speak to the World Conference on Religion. Can I help him prepare his speech? And he didn't go to the religious desk of the ANC. They would have said, you know, we know this Methodist and he's that Catholic. He came to me, secular Albi, uh, because he felt I had something what he would call the Holy Spirit. And we did connect up. He, putting it in a religious framework, if you like, ideologically, I in my secular humanist framework, but they were the same core values. Uh, and somehow it even connected us more strongly because we were so dissimilar. And yet finding uh, that that connectedness purely at the basis of profoundly important beliefs for which both of us were literally prepared to give our lives. How did you get involved in the ANC and the, and the, and the fight against apartheid? Well, I told you about growing up in, in, in a family where my mom, and by the way, even my name, I, mean, I didn't stand a chance, Albert, I was named after Albert and Zula, who was a communist, who'd been in a trade unionist, who died shortly before I was born. See, before I was born, uh, the name uh, somehow uh, was, was connected. Uh, ironically, very anti monarchist family, he would have been named after Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's consort. That's the dialectic of history uh, that, that I'm named after a communist who was named after uh, the prince. In any event, um, but I hated my parents assuming that I would automatically follow in their footsteps. And all the way to school, I took part in debates. I was editor of the literary of the, of the school magazine. Uh, I was a great mountain climber. I played cricket right up till my beginning of my second year at university. I didn't want them to feel I'm automatically going to follow their ideals. And then I met a young crowd who had those ideals. And I was ready. I was ready. And 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 um, in fact, it was a poetry, uh, a poetry evening that made that connection for me. Uh, an Afrikaans South African poet called Eisbrecher from the Afrikaner community, a rebel who'd been in Spain towards the end of the Civil War. And my mother told me uh, Eisbrecher is going to give some lectures. You should go, and I went. And he spoke about Federico Lorca, Spanish poet. I didn't even know they had poets in Spain. They had bullfights. And he told stories about the end of the Civil War, the fascists taking over, Lorca being assassinated or being killed by a fighting squad at five in the afternoon and reciting the poem, and he walked up and down on the stage and it was so dramatic, and he's speaking a bit of Spanish, and a little bit of French, and Afrikaans, and English, and lots of English. 
and it did something for me. It connected up that inwardness, the longings, the soulfulness that I had. So I got through poetry, through reading, through novels, with the great public events of the world. So poetry wasn't just that private little thing of nursing your secret soul. Poetry now became a link with the passions of the world outside. And then next it was Pater de Ruda and uh, Nicholas Kian, a, a Cuban poet. And I was ready. And a few months later, I was volunteering to go to jail in the Defiance and Just Force campaign. People asked me afterwards, LB, why did you bring culture into politics? Because I wrote a lot on culture and against that kind of rather rigid, stultified, uh, instrumentalist, view of art and culture towards a much more nuanced, dynamic, a profound culture as who you are, not something you bring in and leave out, it's something part of your personality and nature. In any event, why did you bring culture into politics and the other way around? So that poetry session that propelled me into politics and everything followed from that. I want to um, move move forward again, um, and I, I can't. I, I want to leave a little bit of time to speak about um, your time on the constitutional courts. But I mean, there can't be many judges um, in in modern history who have played a role in writing the constitution that they then get to enforce as a judge. What was that like, building from scratch a, a, a constitution which has become a, a human rights? Um, you know, example of, of human rights, and particularly social rights, through the world. You know, Adam, that was my soft vengeance. It was amazing. I feel so super privileged that, you know, I had the privilege of my white skin. It was privilege put on me, but it meant I could dream of doing anything. A bigger privilege of being part of the freedom movement. Fantastic. Then the privilege of a lawyer helping to write your country's constitution, then sitting on the court, and then even the privilege of helping with the design of a magnificent building that we're in. Anyway, now writing the constitution, it took us years. It was tough. We had breakdowns. And it was so, so dramatic, so intense. And we always worked as teams and teams and teams and teams. Uh, and, 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 you know, it was also wonderful. We spent decades pulling down, denouncing anti-apartheid. Down with, down with, down with, away with, release Nelson Mandela, free Nelson Mandela. That was great. Now we had a chance to build, to heal. Some of the comrades never took to it. They were again, they were against. And they played an important role. They were cross with us afterwards for not doing more in the constitution and afterwards. But some of us were aching to heal, to build a whole different side of ourselves was able to express itself. It was fantastic for me as a lawyer. You had to find a new language. Uh, instead of this tight, what I would call rather positivistic, laconic English approach to constitutions, say the minimum, uh, deal with the structures, don't waste words. Words were values. Words were a bit of rights. Words were foundational principles. Words were the preamble. The soul had to come before the body, uh, before the structures. And we created a constitution that is deeply value laden, uh, that is rooted in our history. It's rooted in pain and hope. Uh, I once wrote that all constitutions represent uh, the aim for the ideal, for perfection, and guarding against corruption, the wickedness, the balance between the two. We had to build all that in. So it was thrilling activity, intellectually, emotionally, in every possible way. And then you were appointed a, 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 the, one of the first justices of the Constitutional Court. And I, I, I've read that you, you say that the, 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 the work of the court in those early years was very was a very sort of creative um, time because you were um, you were interpreting for the first time a new constitution, so you had to do things. Everything you were doing was for the first time. Um, 
what what of the judgments that made you cry? Can you talk about that? I can tell you about a judgment uh, that kept me up all night and said, well, these people of capital punishment, just the profundity of it. Uh, a judgment where I nearly resigned from the court. Uh, it, it dealt with uh, eviction of homeless people who put up their shacks on land uh, in an area called Port Elizabeth, uh, vacant land next to a very upmarket white suburb. And they've been there for five, ten years. And now the owners of the homes nearby went to the council and said, get them out. They're sitting on our property. And the council, the black council, went to court, had them evicted. The case came up to the Supreme Court of Appeal and found a very technical basis for overturning the eviction. And that was appealed to the Constitutional Court. And Arthur Chaskerson asked me to write the judgment, the better judgment for the court. And I said, oh no, I can't. I can't, I can't. I've sworn to uphold the law without fear, favor, or prejudice. And you can't come and put up your shacks on somebody else's land. It's unfair, it's unfortunate, but you can't do it. It's unlawful. And I've sworn an oath. I, as the judge, have to uphold the eviction. And I, as Albie, I can't. I can't. They're desperately poor people. This is the only home they've got. The whites have got beautiful homes nearby. They're not even using the land. And the black people have been dispossessed of their land. By law, 90% of the land is reserved for whites only. By law. Over decades. I can't do it. And if I can't fulfill my oath, I have to leave the bench. <laughs> Fortunately for me, I was able to convert a moral crisis into a legal tension. Because the same constitution that gives indirect protection of property rights also gives a right of access to adequate housing. The two collide. And when the two collide, then you need a form of mediation to resolve the collision between these two principles, protection of property uh, and the right to a home. And there hadn't been any mediation. And out of that, I just refer to mediation. And a later case, my colleague, Zakia Cook, said, mediation is not enough. We need meaningful engagement between the parties. And that's become a very important part of our law, a very rich and creative part of our law, a bit like restorative justice, bringing the parties and you report. It's not just saying go and settle the case. You engage. If the council wants them off that property, then the council must ensure that they get alternative accommodation somewhere. And maybe the landowners can put up some money to find alternative accommodation. And you can get a fair result of a very really inequitable situation. So I didn't decide. Uh, maybe that's one of the cases I remember. And can you tell us about, there's a case involving H treatment for HIV, um, which is, I, I think was the first case that I came across in an English um, case that I was involved in. I was involved in a, a case about um, asylum seekers being given treatment for dialysis. And that and, and that case was was cited and I read it. Um, but can can you talk about that and how that um, impacted on yes. you? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, possibly the most important case we decided in my 15 years on the court was the treatment action campaign case. It was when the pandemic of HIV was hitting our country hard and 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 tens, hundreds of thousands of people were dying. It looks like we've got our democracy, we've got our freedom, and now we're being destroyed by, by, by this disease. And now antiretrovirals come onto the scene. And, and there happened to be a lot of denialism, HIV denialism, in very high places, right up to the president in, in our country. And the Ministry of Health was not rolling out the vaccine, uh, the antiretroviral sort of. Uh, and it was simply limiting it to two test sites in each of the nine provinces. On the ground, the treatment action campaign, literally tens and tens of scores, hundreds of thousands of people living with HIV organized themselves. It's an extraordinary example of civil society mobilizing. They had great journalists telling their stories and 
excellent lawyers relying on our constitution and the progressive realization of social economic rights. And the, I mean, let me tell you the story. As we about to go into the court to hear the decision being given by Arthur Jasperson, my colleague Sandeep Ngobo says, Albi, would you like my handkerchief? Uh, and I said, no, no, I'm okay. And the background to that was a few months earlier, he'd given a decision about somebody who wanted a job as an airline steward uh, on South African Airways. He passed all the tests with flying colors, but he was HIV positive. So the Airways said, we'll employ you on the ground. He says, no, I want to pour coffee. Don't discriminate against me. And they refused. The case came up to us, and Sandiri wrote an exquisite judgment about the importance of work. And if our publicly owned airline gives in to prejudice, then our duty is to combat that prejudice. The Constitution doesn't allow people not to be employed simply because they're HIV positive. They're not going to transmit the disease by pouring the coffee. Exquisite judgment. And the court at that stage had people sitting in it with T-shirts saying HIV positive men, women, young, old, black, brown. It was like the nation. And he gave that decision. He went out and he was cheering. And I started crying. I was crying not just because of the impact of the pandemic, to feel I'm a judge. I'm part of this project. We have rights that are so meaningful in our country. It's just an overwhelmingly marvelous feeling. So now we're about to go back into court and treat the action campaign case on giving navirapine to women about to give birth, living with the HIV. Navirapine would cut the transmission then by 50%, now it's by 95%. And Sandiri offers me his handkerchief. He knows what the results would be. I say, now I'm okay today. We go in, we sit down. Arthur reads out the decision. And the decision tells, declares that the government is obliged to provide the vaccine. So the antiretroviral. Uh, as in terms of the rights of the people, in terms of the health sections provisions in our constitution, the rights of the child, the rights of women and mothers, and, and so on. Dead silence. Same people sitting with the HIV positive t-shirts on. We go outside, the cheering comes again, and I cried again. And I wrote about that because I wanted students and other judges and lawyers and people to know that judges can cry. Maybe cowboys don't cry, but judges cry. They cry over human beings. And it wasn't crying on the bench, which could be embarrassing to everybody. But it was that sense of emotion that was just so profound, of, of elation uh, in terms of what the, what the law is capable of doing. I mean, uh, uh, your book, The, the Strange Al Alchemy of Life and Law, um, really g gets to the heart of the, the judicial task which from the from the, the the lower lawyer perspective who only I'm ever, only ever front in front of judges rather than being a judge um it really shows i mean we we you can't you, we all know that judges are humans like everybody else but there's some inhuman aspect to being a judge i think there's this idea that you have to be objective um as if you you have to exclude your your underlying humanity and become a sort of almost godlike figure. I, I think you described it as, as judgments and um, telling lies about themselves. Um, do, do you think being a judge is he, you know, being a good judge is possible for someone who's been so involved in politics, even as a lawyer? Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I was part of a generation of, of, of people who'd fought for freedom in South Africa. Some lawyers like Oliver Tambo, Nelson Mandela, Mandela was in jail 27 years. Tambo gave his life to the struggle. Uh, Joe Slovo 
uh, became a, a brilliant advocate. Uh, you knew who the best advocates were when the police were in trouble. They would try and get him to defend them. Uh, he became a military commander and, and one of the leaders of, of a revolutionary struggle to bring about change in South Africa. Uh, I was never involved in the military combat, uh, but very heavily involved in the Constitutional Committee of the ANC and working on envisaging a new constitution. We didn't want race and race quotas and power sharing between races in South Africa. We wanted a united, non-racial and often we said non-sexist South Africa with rights protected through a Bill of Rights. And that became part of our struggle. So it wasn't like it's war, 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 suddenly it's peace, peace, peace. Already during the war, we are aiming at peace and getting conditions for peace and creating the foundations in exile of what became our final constitution. We demanded that we don't negotiate our new constitution. We don't have a Lancaster House. The constitution can only be negotiated by the people of South Africa through the democratically elected representatives, the constituent assembly. And then we ended up with a two-stage process of constitution making where we negotiated the process to get the constitution making assembly in terms of certain principles agreed to in advance that would guarantee non-oppression in the new society, a separation of powers, fundamental rights, multi-party democracy, that we agreed to in advance. And then the new parliament, consisting of people who in the great majority had been oppressed under apartheid, had been in the struggle, had been in resistance, in exile, in the underground, in prison, and so on. They wrote the new constitution. And that's why it's got that strong spirit of freedom. You capture that moment when liberation comes to consolidate. It's the first constitution in the world to include sexual orientation as a prohibited ground of discrimination. The first constitution in the world to have environmental rights, this is in 1996, as a constitutional principle. The first constitution in the world to make gender-based violence a constitutional issue. No violence from the state or from private sources. Because we had a strong women's movement, well represented in parliament, insisting on all these different elements. So in that sense, the process of making the constitution became the bridge from the past the bridge inside me to becoming a judge afterwards and the judge now to defend the things we've been fighting for. And often I had to declare with my colleagues against the ANC, against Mandela, uh, because what they did was not in keeping with the constitution that the ANC had been the principal party in, in creating. And it wasn't difficult or complex, complicated for me at all because this was the pinnacle, the epitome of the values and the things we've been fighting for. And we wanted to hold, I in particular, if you like, if anything, I had a special, a special incentive to hold my movement, the movement that's been my movement, to account to the highest, highest standard. In terms of my statement, every judgment I write is a lie. That is another whole thing altogether. The lie is that the judgment was written in the way it appears. The result was so simple and easy. A, B, C, D, E. In fact, once my, my secretary hid away my draft, she said, Albie, you've done 26 versions. I'm not making another change. Uh, so the lie is that it was so simple, a tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. In fact, the writing jumped tock tock, tick tick, tick tock, tock, were all over the place. And that was explained to me by a political scientist at the University of Toronto. You said, Albie, it's the difference between the logic of discovery and the logic of justification. And the discovery, it comes to you in the bath, on the bus, in bed, the three Bs. It just comes. It comes as a result of loads and loads of work, but it's click. Justification is the rationalizing. And it's when you get the two connected, that core organizing principle and idea makes sense. It deals with all the profound issues, maybe in a proportional way, maybe in a purely logical classification way. Then you set about the reasoning and the justification. And that took ages and ages and revision after revision. I, I'm just going to ask one more question. But before I do, can I remind people that if you want to 
um, ask a question or for me to ask a question on your behalf, please put it in the comments um, under the Facebook um, live video or the YouTube video and we'll, and we'll pull them out. Um, but also I, I'm just asked to remind you that you can give general feedback on the session um, at jw3.org.uk forward slash feedback. Um, I'll be just one more question before I open up to, to the floor. What do you think the purpose of, of human rights is? Um, because, and, and I ask that, it's a, it's a sort of sounds like a bit almost a basic question, but it, it feels like in, in the world today, as maybe as always, we are constantly having to justify and explain why we need these basic values, these, these rights that we fought so hard for. Why do you think we need human rights? We need it, I think, in a way that lawyers need it more, more than anybody. The judges need it. And it shouldn't just depend upon the predilections of Albie's a very uh, empathetic person uh, and so on. It should be in the Constitution, it should be in the structure, it should be in the legal education, it should be in the judgments that establish precedent. Uh, this is what it's about. It, it's so humanizing, it's so enriching to, to feel everybody counts, everybody counts. Uh, there's certain forms of basic protection that everybody's entitled to. Uh, democracy is not simply regular elections, important as they are. It's not simply freedom of speech. It's that sense of human interconnectedness that, that, that's so foundational. And of course, for us, in the post-apartheid South Africa, we wouldn't have a country without it. We had to learn to respect the humanity of everybody. Uh, to have law and order without respect for humanity would have been another form of cruelty and, and the kind of, if you like, emotional dispossession. The two had to go together. Uh, and it doesn't mean anarchy. It doesn't mean lack of rules. It doesn't mean lack of predictability. People should know what's expected of them and what their conduct should be and, and what gets them into trouble. So you have that, but you understand that and you apply that in ways that are meaningful. And it's the law is particularly important, not for the rich and powerful. They even, the business people settle most of their problems not going through the law. They, they settle it directly through mediation or through stronger power. The law is important for the dispossessed, the marginalized, the impoverished, the people who have been kept down, the people who belong to minority faiths and groups and so on. And that's part of the richness and the texture of a society that it, it, it recognizes everybody. And we get very preachy in South Africa. I get particularly preachy uh, on these different things. But it's not a preachiness in relation to the good society or getting into heaven uh, or saving your soul. It's a preachiness in overcoming the terrible pain that is inflicted, the terrible injustices that still exist in our society. But in that sense, it's an existential and a philosophical thing. Going together at the same time. I'm going to open the question to questions from the floor now, the, the virtual floor, um, and the first one is from Sarah. Um, no, no, no last name. She says you mentioned Mandela's magnanimity. Your sorry, magnanimity. <laughs> excuse me. Um, yours is remarkable. How did you find the strength to heal without malice? You know what I find difficult is to explain it. Uh, for me, it's so obvious. It's so much more powerful than being eaten up with anger. It's transcendent. It gives significance and meaning to your life. It explains why you lost an arm. You know, if I was offered my arm back, I would take it now. I'm so used to being in life uh, as, as I am. But it was part partially. In my case, I was a volunteer in the struggle. I can't complain at the very threats and distress that uh, I anticipated. We used to read stories about political prisoners and surviving torture and so on. So I can't complain. I can't say uh, nature, uh, destiny has been uh, malign. 
and unfair to me. But I can feel joyous and triumphant. And when I discover Mandela is saying the same thing, and and what is the sort of saying the same thing, and Governor Becky, Winnie Mandela, not quite the same thing. Uh, Albertina Susulu saying the same thing, Fatima Mir saying the same thing. Then I realize it's part of our culture. And it's a very strong culture, and it's a culture that gave us a nation instead of endless war, but now it's out to and made it to us. So malice to me seems so trivial, so shallow, so empty compared to that sense of of of, of transcending what they did to us, not becoming like them, but being motivated by our ideals, our goals, our spirit, our beliefs. It's fantastic. It, it, it's much stronger. It's much more powerful. It's much more resilient than harboring malice and, and a sense of revenge. Um, David Valence has asked, what do you think about the state of South Africa today? Is it a success or is it suffering from corruption? <laughs> it's a success and it's suffering from corruption. <laughs> uh, it, it's a very mixed story. But, you know, the strong thing is that our democracy is very strong. Uh, we've, we've had five general elections that are freer and fairer than American elections. Uh, with no attempts to suppress the vote. Um, we, we've got a very lively press, wonderful investigative journalists. We've got strong civil society. We've got faith movements that speak out. We've got unions that speak out. We've got, we've got a country, South Africa. That's terrific. Uh, and we have uh, fascinating and, and trenchant and interesting art, uh, vocal, dance, uh, conceptual art, uh, uh, terrific museum, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Cape Town, if anybody's around to come and see fantastic art from all over Africa. It's a very rich country in, in, in that sense, a very expressive country. And we've got awful things happening. And maybe the brilliant things, the good things are fantastic and the awful things are particularly ugly. Uh, schools without the trains and children dying in, in, in feces. It's unthinkable that something like that could happen. The corruption, people who spend years fighting for freedom, going to jail, and then setting up forms of looting when they're in government afterwards. It, it, it's unacceptable, it's terrible, it's horrible. You've got gender-based violence. I don't think it's worse than it was. I think it's just more exposed than it was. But that's still happening in our country. That's unacceptable. You've got huge unemployment, especially amongst the youth. That's unacceptable. But we've got the mechanisms. We've got the democracy. We've got the rights. We've got the instruments for dealing with them. And that's what gives me a lot of hope and a lot of courage. And at the pinnacle, panic, the apex of the fall, this constitutional court that we put up in the heart of the old fort prison, the prison where both Gandhi Mandela and many others were locked up. That's where our beautiful court building is today. And it's doing terrific work. Uh, and it's very respected amongst the people, the, the decisions of the court. And I'm pleased to say uh, somebody from the German Federal Constitution Court said they always look first to our decisions in a whole range of cases. A couple of judges on the European Court of Human Rights say they look to our decisions. We've, instead of being a, a universal importer of ideas from outside, we're becoming a universal donor. The Canadian Supreme Court quoting our decisions on the right to prisons to vote. So, so these are the things that give me optimism and hope for South Africa, not in a way that denies the terrible things that are happening, but in a way that says we've got the instruments for courage and the people to deal with them. Can we talk about Constitutional Hill? Um, could you tell us about your role in it? Yes, partly... You know, when we got democracy, this wonderful constitution, we had a parliament building with slightly new occupants, in fact, overwhelmingly new occupants, in Cape Town. We had the union buildings for the presidency in Pretoria up on the hill, very beautiful buildings, put up at the height of the imperial sort of grandeur. 
but we didn't have a building for the Constitutional Court. So we couldn't postpone our decisions until we had a building. We had Tempe accommodation and we started looking for a place. And we were taken to many, many different sites. And then we were taken to the old Fort Prison, he commissioned, set up by Paul Kruger in the 1890s because he suspected the British would try and seize the gold field. And the Brits did. So the Boers captured the Brits and locked up the Boers. The Boers, sorry, the Boers captured the Brits and locked up the Brits, the Jamison raid. The Brits then won the Anglo-Boer War, the South African War, locked up the Boers. The Boers won political power, they locked up the Blacks. And our generation said enough already. We must stop locking each other up. We have a constitution. This is the site where we want our court to be. So redolent with our history. It happened to be the highest point in Johannesburg, really accessible, integrated into the city, not a remote court far away. So that's where we built the court. We had an international competition, which was won by a brilliant young architect with his view of justice under a tree. Not a copy of the American Supreme Court, which is a vague copy of an imagined, not quite Greek, not quite German court, but a South African court with a South African feel, but using modern techniques of building with lots of light and visibility and using bricks from one building we had to take down to clad the wall behind where the judges sit, using cowhide sin skins in front of the judges so that our knees can't be seen, a very African feel. And instead of having quotes from the Magna Carta or the blindfolded woman, these rather tired symbols in quarters, we had our own uh, 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 logo for the court justice under a tree. And it's filled with art donated to us by our artists. And it's not just art put in in nice little nooks and corners. The doors created by artists, the security gates, the carpets, the chandeliers, so it's a brilliant building, a wonderful building, it's a humane building, uh, and a building that happens to also have passive cooling, taking the cool night air and sending it into the building during the day, and it makes such a difference because you have a natural feel, and when it rains, you can hear the rain, and you can see the sunlight going through the building. It's not an artificially lit, an artificially uh, uh, controlled, a temperature control building. It's a real building for real people and hopefully for real judges. So I take people on tours. COVID has prevented me from doing that. I live in Cape Town, but it's something I'm looking forward to after we, unfortunately, not vaccinated yet. I'm hoping uh, from the 17th of May to get my vaccination uh, when I can travel more easily and to be able to conduct tours of Constitution here, of Constitutional Court. Uh, meanwhile, I work on the Constitution of your Trust, uh, telling some of the stories that I've been telling to you today and to the listeners today, but also about the architecture, uh, about the road of the judges, about the themes we introduced into that space that are that, uh, part and parcel of the environment in which I function. And I might say that when you got your Supreme Court, one of my greatest delights was to offer to the uh, Lord Chief Justice at that stage, I think, some tips about what can be done to make a court more friendly, uh, more accessible, more warm, more humane, uh, and more appropriate for its functions. Yeah, and, and our Supreme Court is the most accessible court in our, in our jurisdiction by far. And just before we leave Constitutional Hill, can you tell us about, about this blue dress that's in the... <laughs> That's in the in, yeah. in on your on the front of your book, and is also in the Supreme Court. I'll just hold it up so everyone can see it. Yes, you know that that's um, it's not the normal thing you see on a cover of a judicial memoir, <laughs> uh, and it's there for a very strong reason. Uh, when the Truth Commission was was having its hearings, one of the stories was about Peter and Wandre. She was an ANC combatant, guerrilla who uh, came from Swaziland, crossed the border into South Africa. She was captured and she was executed. And um, the man who killed her 
told the story to the Truth Commission, and the body was recovered. And they discovered it was a nude body except for a little bit of blue plastic covering her private parts. And the story was she'd been stripped naked. She refused to testify against the comrades. She was executed. And the man who killed her kind of sniggered and he said, God, she was brave. But at least her body was recovered. Her family learned about her last moments. She was given a dignified burial. In any event, Judith Mason, the artist, heard that story. And she wanted to do something for what she called my sister. And she got hold of some plastic bags and she sewed them into a dress. And she wrote beautiful words on the bottom of the dress, sister, this may not be the whole armor of God, but what they did to you, and, and she went on. Uh, and what you did was take a piece of rubbish uh, and protect yourself. What a housewifely, commonsensical thing to do. And they didn't compound the abuse of you by stripping you a second time. Uh, and, and it was an expression of her love and respect for the people who sacrificed for the freedom in our constitution. Uh, and then she did a painting that went with the dress showing a snarling dog behind some wire with the dress of freedom, as it were, hanging up, dedicated to Peel and Blundway. And the wife of the Chief Justice, Arthur Traskelson, uh, Lorraine, uh, told me, you must go to the exhibition. And that's where I saw it. Uh, I heard the story from, from the artist. And I said, we don't have much money, but we'd love to have that picture in our court. And she said, no, you must take it. I managed to get a little bit of funding. And we hung the dress and the picture. But I also said to Judith, the picture you have is so hard, it's so harsh. And we've got somewhere with our truth commission. Can't you do a softer picture? And she did one showing some burning braziers, uh, coal braziers, giving a warmth and a glow with the dog in the background and the dress hanging. And I said, can we take all three? It became like a triptych. And it's become the most famous picture uh, installation in our court. Uh, and people cry when they read the, the, the statement that's written, written on the dress. And we feel it belongs there so much that that spirit captured by the artist of, of reverence, if you like, for what went into our constitution. And I was thrilled when, when Oxford University Press suggested putting the picture on uh, the cover of the book. I've got a question here from Raymond Simonson, who is the chief executive of JW3. Um, he asks, as a high profile South African Jew um, involved in the anti-apartheid movement, do you get asked a lot in a lot of interviews for your views on Israel? And do you think the <laughs> and what do you think of the accusations of apartheid? And and if so, how do you feel about the expectation that you should express a clear opinion on this? And how do you respond? So just finishing with a light question, um, a straightforward question. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you how I respond. I respond by telling a story. In the year 2000, uh, I'm invited by the Kennedy School of Government to go to Gaza to take part in a conference, a workshop on the rule of law, and I accept. And it's the first time I've been to what I call that part of the world. If, if you give it any more description, you're already taking sides. Uh, and we arrive in, in Tel Aviv, and there's a car from the South African mission in Ramallah sends a driver to fetch me and, and my wife in the next September. Uh, and it's a Christian Arab who's driving. We go through the checkpoint to Ramallah. Afterwards, then a couple of days there, through a checkpoint down to Gaza, through another checkpoint. And I see him wincing every time he has to show his documents. It was an extraordinary workshop, lively, spirited, full of argumentation. Somebody saying, I was imprisoned by the Israelis, now I've been imprisoned by the Palestinians. Somebody else saying that there was a reason for one, not for the other. 
And in the end, I just spoke about Nelson Mandela. Uh, and in South Africa, we were fighting not just for the state, but for dignity, for human dignity. And what I thought the role of the leader should be. And that was, in a sense, my commentary feeding something in to the Palestinians there, living in a constitutional democracy. I get a message that Yasser Arafat would like to meet you. So we go through the checkpoints again, same wincing. We arrive at that famous compound that you always saw on TV. Uh, and there is Yasser Arafat looking just like Yasser Arafat with a stubble, with the scarf. He comes up to me. He says, this man is a hero. And he kisses me on both cheeks with his stubble. The next morning, I'm in Jerusalem sitting on the bench next to Aran Barak. And I'm thinking, a white South African Jew. I didn't keep my being with the other from either of them. But I have that ability to move from the one to the other. And I understand where Israel comes from. What it means to my cousins, to many others, against the historic persecution of Jews. Why it's got so much meaning to have a Jewish state. But I also understand why Palestinians feel oppressed and have their desire to have a state uh, and dignity. And, and my own feeling is, as happened in South Africa, in the end, what's required is a strong Palestinian state, not a weak one, a dignified one. And then the congruence between the two states, the shared interest will really come out rather than a subdued uh, state with outward form of statehood, but no real form of independence. Even yeah, those are my views, that I might have a role because of the peculiar history, if you like, that I have in South Africa and as a person to connect up at an appropriate moment the two sides. So I don't answer the question about is Israel an apartheid state. So the great disappointment of many people who support the BDS I don't answer questions going the other way as well. I don't. So that's my answer. My answer is I don't give an answer. That's a, that's a good answer. I keep myself available for maybe, maybe, maybe one day. Yeah. Well, 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 I, well I, hope you, I hope that will become a reality. Um, I just want to fin I, I we're, we're very sadly running out of time. Um, I do have time to ask at least one more question. This is one, hopefully a bit less controversial than the last one, but one that's close to my heart. Um, and it's from Jason Breyer, who's a, 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 another Jewish barrister, a British Jewish barrister. He says, as an author of one of the exemplar written constitutions, what's your view of the UK's unwritten constitution? If you put the question, should the UK have a written constitution. Uh, strangely enough, I, I, I get a little bit nervous because I'm scared it'll actually be used to cut the UK off from the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, you're still there. Brexit doesn't cut you out. If it's yeah, we're, 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 thank goodness we're still hanging on. Right, right. I think that's so important two ways, yeah. what Britain has to contribute to the jurisprudence of it, but also what Britain has to learn, sharing with others, independently of the common market aspect and so on. That, 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 that's very much part of your, your own decision. So the, in an earlier time, the push for a Bill of Rights was coming from what I call the progressive, the left forces. Uh, Helena Kennedy was pushing very strongly, and I spoke on behalf of, of, of the Bill of Rights, especially for Northern Ireland, but for the whole of the UK. The push for a written constitution was coming from conservative forces. I don't mean conservative party, because there are lots of very progressive-minded people in the conservative party, but who wanted to keep human rights out of it uh, through having a written constitution. Uh, that's my one response. The other response is a discovery I made when I was just out of hospital and I got some funding uh, from 
I was working at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies in West of London, who converted a bathroom into uh, an office for me to work on a new constitution for South Africa. Got money from from CEDA, the Swedish National Development Agency, Ford Foundation. Brilliant. It turned out I had like 80 months just to work on planning, thinking about a new constitution. Not writing one, but ideas, ideas, ideas. And um, in any event, during that time, I decided, let me go to Norway, a country I love, social democratic country, a uh, lot of social awareness, but it's an open society. It's a very free society, multi-party democracy. I'm sure we'll get great support from Norway. I go to Norway and I ask about the constitution. I say, oh, yes, yes, we've got a constitution. We never use it. It's not it's an important historical document and it's connected with our separation from Denmark and Sweden and so on. And then I thought, what's going on here? Something similar in Sweden, uh, in Holland, in the UK. I say to myself, where would I rather be locked up? In London or in Washington? Washington with a constitution, London with an unwritten constitution. I'd rather be locked up in London. Maybe if I spoke with an Irish accent in those days, or if I had long hair, maybe not. But then it occurred to me that what matters is not so much the constitution as such, the constitutionalism. And there is constitutionalism in, in Norway and all the countries that kept the monarchy, a slight exception when you beheaded King Charles the first, a, a deal was done with the new ruling class, if you like. The monarchy aristocracy was retained, but parliament became supreme. But there were certain understandings about the exercise of power, and sovereignty remained with the sovereign, technically. But once you behead the sovereign, or you break away and create a new country, where's your sovereignty? So the sovereignty has to be replaced with a compact, with an agreement, with some kind of document that keeps the nation, in that sense, uh, provides unity to it. I happen to mention what I call my regicide theory of Bill of Rights. That's where Bill of Rights comes in, to Princess Anne, when I got an honorary degree at the University of London, and we had dinner afterwards. And she said, oh, I do hope we can get a bit of rights through less, less plastic means in the United Kingdom. Uh, so that's my regicide theory of a bit of rights. So I don't think regicide is, is on the cards in the United Kingdom now, which might require some kind of document of, of, of that kind. Uh, but I do think mechanisms should be found to entrench certain core fundamental values. Call it a bill of rights. Uh, called it some kind of supermajority, special procedures are required to amend. Uh, what was done in some other countries was a special convention was called uh, to almost be like a new constitutional body, not just parliament itself. Uh, that was very important in Colombia. Uh, in India, there was a constitution assembly we had our parliament acting as a constitutional assembly. Uh, maybe some kind of body like that could be created in the United Kingdom. Otherwise, you get the conundrum if parliament passes a law requiring a supermajority, another parliament can come along and say, no, we're sovereign, we're elected by the people, and we're going to disregard that. So you might need some kind of external body, uh, very, very solemn, uh, very, very representative in another kind of a way to create an entrenched Bill of Rights for the UK. I'm, I'm absolutely devastated to say I'm going to have to end there. Um, but Albie, it's been a, a great honour for me to talk to you and, and, and an inspiring hour and a half, I'm sure, for everybody watching. Um, before we finish, I'm just going to hand back over to um, Rachel from JW3, and say thank you again to JW3 and to the Genesis Philanthropy Group. And most of all, to you. Sorry, just before you change, I was hoping for a chance to tell you, and I'm going to tell you very quickly now, uh, 
Guggenheim, friends of Guggenheim are visiting Cape Town, Johannesburg in about 1996. We've just got a new constitution called. I'm asked to speak to them about the changes in South Africa. And I'm speaking to them about it's amazing how we got transformation without the bloodshed and violence, black and white working together. And the head of the Guggenheim says, it's a miracle. It's a miracle, she says. Three Jews on the constitutional court. <laughs> Arthur Jaskelson, uh, um, gosh, um, <laughs> my first friend, um, uh, myself, and, 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 gosh, he got into trouble with the report he gave on, on Gaza. Goldstone. Uh, Richard Goldstone. Richard Goldstone, my close and wonderful friend, Richard Goldstone, happened to be on the Constitutional Court. And it wasn't pure accident coming from our backgrounds and being supportive of the resistance and change at a time when the bar was overwhelmingly white and the judges moving up were overwhelmingly white, that three out of the first 11 judges happened to be Jews. Well, I'll be, I, I, I've got to finish by saying you, you, you may not know this, but Lady Hale, who has just finished as the, uh, as the first female president of our Supreme Court justice was also Pathbreaker. She was the first non-Jewish president of the UK Supreme Courts <laughs> <laughs> because the first two, Lord Phillips and Lord Newberger, were Jewish. So um, for a country of 250,000 odd Jews, it's pretty impressive. Um, something going on there. Um, so thank you so much. I am now going to pass over to Rachel before I get cut off <laughs> by the technology. Thank you, Albie and Adam, for this extraordinary conversation, which unfolded so richly in a tapestry of stories, complete with an encore. Um, I'm awestruck. I, I think I can speak for the invisible audience at home. Uh, we're awestruck by your stories, Albie, and uh, we're reminded that to change the world, you need to tell compelling stories, stories compelling enough to dislodge the deeply held ones in possession before. And I'm also personally struck by the depth of transcendent compassion that accompanies the fight in your spirit. Um, thank you to all of you who asked questions or indeed sent comments about how Albie's actions have touched you or your families as many of you were moved to do. And thank you also for filling in the survey, which is linked to in the chat. Our aim in this series is to connect Jews and Jewish experience all over the world through conversation. And we do need to hear from you to help us do that better and better. Uh, before I bring this evening to a close, I invite you to join us again at JW3. If you like recent history, you might also like our series of classes on Thursday mornings, War Drums Across the Balkans, Yugoslavia 1989 to today, that's online at the moment. If you like Jewish culture, you might also like our series of evening classes with the fantastic YIVO Institute of Jewish Research, taking in topics from the rise and fall of Salonika to weddings in cemeteries to ward off cholera, also online. And if, like me, you live near JW3 and have small children, you will almost certainly like the playgroups, children's classes and family activities we have on at the moment, all safely distanced in real life in our building. The families who've been back so far certainly love them. For information on all this and much more, please visit our website and sign up to receive our newsletter. So I end once again by saying thank you to Adam Wagner, to Albie Sachs and Genesis Philanthropy Group for this conversation. At the beginning, I welcomed you all to a very special evening, and that can often be just a turn of phrase. Tonight, it's being proved completely true. I wish you all a very good night.